If you talk tanks in World War II, which, to be honest, is a common thing on this platform, there are a few that get all of the attention. And of those few, there is one that stands clearly above the others in both adoration and infamy. The Panzerkampfwagen 6 Tiger. Now I know I've been doing history about Azure Lane's ship foos on this channel, but as we all know, there is one other big military history with Waifu's franchise out there, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't address it. After all, my very first successful video on this channel was made using Girls on Panzer as a base, and despite how much love and attention I've put into our wonderful boat waifus, I have far more experience with aviation and armour than I do with boats. Don't worry though, Enterprise's script is coming along rather nicely, and at this time of recording, we have finally worked out issues with Akagi's video, and that will be staying up, fully monetized, and fully promoted. So, that's all good. But in the meantime, I'm going to do something really fun by simultaneously pandering to and pissing off Wearaboos. And if this video sucks, I'm going to have to answer to Maho, and let's be real, no one who values their lives wants to answer to Maho. But guess what? This documentary is actually a two-for-one documentary because we're also going to be doing the Tiger and, at the same time, a brief history of the Wehrmacht. So get ready, because it's history lesson time. Now, forgive me for being presumptuous, but I'm going to assume that you guys all know the background of Germany in the 1930s, or at least the basics of it. But for those of you who don't, let me sum it up for you. Germany broke, Germany woke, Germany based, Germany bigger, the Austrians acquiesce, the Brits back off, and the Czechs check out. With us so far. Okay, good. Now we're on the same page, let's talk about everyone's favourite thing. Doctrine. By this time, it was pretty obvious to everyone who wasn't intellectually comatose or in blatant denial that war was on the horizon. But like pretty much all long-standing institutions, militaries tend to default to, or worse, depend on, prior information and experience when formulating plans for the future. However, the Reichswehr, now the Wehrmacht, had undergone drastic changes since their defeat during the First World War. The Allied offensives during that war at Cambrai, followed later by the 100 Days Offensive at Amiens and the Hindenburg Line, had demonstrated the power of combined arms warfare, namely the integration of artillery, infantry, tanks and air power into a single cohesive fighting force, which defeats the enemy in an open battle, breaking their lines and ultimately forcing a rout. This was essentially the ultimate evolution of what's known as the set-piece battle. However, to the Germans, or let's be honest here, the Prussians, these developments meant something very different. During the late 1920s and the early 1930s, the British Army had experimented with armoured warfare, with the creatively titled Experimental Mechanised Force. They had tried using tanks and infantry in a single mobile unit, combined with strong air and artillery support. But due to the doctrinal failings in the British Army at the time, as well as tanks designed for either infantry support, such as the Matilda series of tanks, or tanks that amounted to glorified tracked scout cars, they had fallen flat on their asses. And until the development of the Cruiser series of tanks, Crusader and the Cromwell, the British armoured forces had neither the doctrine nor the equipment to engage in armoured warfare with any serious success. But during these exercises, like all major military exercises, there were foreign attaches present, and there was one group in particular paying very close attention. Yeah, I think you can all see where this one's going. Prussia, later Germany, had always drawn the short straw when it came to geopolitics in Europe. Every political or military conflict Germany ended up in, due to its location in the very centre of the continent, inevitably results in a war on multiple fronts, or worse, a war on every front. Not only that, Germany, despite having a very powerful industry when compared to the rest of Europe, 
does not have much in the way of natural resources beyond the basic stuff. Meaning, in the modern, rapidly globalising world of the 19th and 20th centuries, they had to import what they need to wage war, namely coal, oil, iron, and rare metals. Which, when going back to the war on all fronts things, is, as as they say, uh, suboptimal. The way the German military and political thinkers at the time dealt with this is, in a piece of dark irony, rather similar to how contemporary Israel deals with it. The old saying goes that states have an army while Prussia's army has a state, and it achieves its aims one of two ways. Either A, setting the surrounding nations and allies on each other while you sit in the middle riding out the storm, and occasionally profiting from both sides, otherwise known as the Bismarck strategy, or you wage rapid wars of aggression, preemptively and ferociously demolishing your enemies in short, efficient campaigns waged over short to moderate distances. Frederick the Great, Clausewitz, and Moltke all followed the same mantra, known as the Prussian style. And while the government, politics, and material conditions of Germany had changed, due to the somewhat fixed nature of geopolitics, that uh, being the geo part, it's really hard to move countries, the overall strategic position of Germany hadn't changed. The Germans therefore specialised in what's known to them as Bewegungskrieg, or manoeuvre warfare, a doctrine calling for well-trained, organised and fast-moving troops to break through the enemy's weak points and cause havoc in their rear. They had done it all throughout their modern history, notably during the Franco-Prussian War, and uh, to a not-so-successful degree World War I. And it was the latter conflict that had Germany's modern military theorists thinking. Their stormtroopers had been very effective during the Kaiserschlag defensive, and their Prussian manoeuvre warfare had slaughtered the Russians on the Eastern Front, most famously at Tannenberg. Modern armies had lines and fronts crossing entire continents now, hence wars had become more static. Furthermore, the advent of high-powered artillery, aircraft, and most of all the machine gun had made offensive operations far more costly to carry out. One man with the right weapon can now wipe out entire companies of men. However, it also takes a lot more men and equipment to man an entire border, not to mention the industry and money to keep the war going, and of course, the longer a war goes on, the more fornicated Germany is. So, what's the solution? The Germans resolved this problem by taking Clausewitz's concept of the Schwerpunkt, that being the main concentrated assault with all your forces, and quadrupled down on it to create Schwerpunkt Reloaded, otherwise known as Blitzkrieg. In simplest terms, Small units of men, stormtroopers and later paratroopers in the German case, along with extensive recon forces, probe and analyse the enemy's defensive arrangements. Once these operations identify weak points in the enemy's line, all available forces are massed behind them. Once assembled, an all-out assault is launched at the various weak points identified, depending on how many men you have, usually around two or three main offensives, with smaller ones at the tactical level. These massed forces come with everything, artillery, infantry, air power, and mechanised forces with tank support. The idea being that with this force blowing a huge hole in the enemy line, the faster and more mobile mechanised and cavalry forces can roll as fast as they can to strategic objectives in the rear, headquarters, rail hubs, factories and natural resources. This rapid offensive has the goal of paralysing the enemy's decision-making abilities, keeping them off balance and forcing them to react to you rather than letting them dictate the flow of battle, firmly retaining the initiative for you. Once the first phase is complete, you then attempt concentric advances. If multiple spearheads break through, their immediate goal is to link up behind enemy lines, cutting off the enemy's frontline defences, which of course results in a Kesselschlacht, or a cauldron battle. A battle of encirclement, in other words, where your main force of infantry mops up the defenders while the mobile forces cut off their escape. Using this method, if the enemy is spread out defending a frontier or border or maintaining a defensive line, and you seize the initiative, or even better, you start the war with the first move, a smaller force can defeat a larger one through encirclement, very similar to Hannibal at the Battle of Cannae. The German army in 1914 actually attempted this with the Schlieffen plan, However, due to the aforementioned advances in technology as well as the distances they needed to cover with only horses and on foot, the Allies managed to stop them cold, forcing Germany into a war of attrition, which is of course 
a war the Germans couldn't win, resulting in the aforementioned Hundred Days Offensive and breaking of the Hindenburg Line, etc. The younger German military thinkers who had fought in that campaign, at the company or junior staff level, men like Erwin Rommel, Heinz Guderian, and Erich von Manstein, had studied these campaigns in retrospect, putting their field and operational experiences to work. Moreover, they had been watching the experiments of French, British, and especially Soviet developments in armoured doctrine. And they had noticed something. All the other nations were practising combined arms warfare, yes, but the arms themselves were divided into each formation. The infantry regiment was under the infantry commander, the artillery was under the artillery commander, the air force under the air commander, etc., etc. While there were numerous strategic and political considerations, at an operational and tactical level, one thing had stopped the Germans from achieving victory in the offensive of 1914. Speed, or rather the lack thereof. Communications were too slow, orders had to be constantly updated, the enemy's defensive capabilities were greatly expanded by the advance in technology and their professional armies, delaying their advance, and most critical of all, their armies had to either ride horses or march into battle, while the enemy had interior lines of reinforcement and communication via road and rail. The result being, German troops and animals would wind up exhausted, all the while being too slow to outrun the defenders, meaning they had to attack with, well, as we say, suboptimal results. After considering these problems, German advocates for armoured warfare put forward two revolutionary ideas. First, they advocated the creation of the Panzer Division, a singular formation unifying all the necessary components for combined armed warfare into a single package. Recon, artillery, tanks, infantry, engineers, the whole shebang. These independent formations would also have one other key component. All of the units in Panzer Divisions, down to the individual tanks, vehicles, and even infantry platoon commanders, all of them would have radios to talk to each other. And later on, radios to talk directly to the Luftwaffe. The other major change was more of a cultural shift in leadership practices. While independent thinking at the tactical level was far more progressive in the Prussian military than most other European states at the time, the aristocratic hierarchies and traditional military mindset was still very much present in the German officer corps throughout World War I and the interwar period. Combine that with the less developed communication systems and you have an army that follows doctrine or the original plan without consideration for the changing circumstances of the battle. Granted, they had generally more flexibility up front than the other armies of the time, but it could always be better. The German officer corps, from their experience in World War I, had taken Clausewitz's and Moltke's analysis of war, famously encapsulated in the phrase, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and they had come up the ranks pushing for change. When they did finally achieve that change, they adopted Mission Command, or Auftragstaktik, and that has since been adopted by pretty much every modern military in one form or another, especially in the United States military. In its most basic explanation, the main strategic concept, for example, defeating France, is disseminated down the chain of command as a series of tasks based on rank and responsibility. You give the men under your command their objective, and they then determine the best way of accomplishing that objective. The reason being is that they are actually fighting the battle, and therefore have a better grasp of the situation on the ground. If they see an opportunity or have a better plan than you, because they have more up-to-date information, they don't have to sit on their asses waiting for you to tell them if they can do it or not. As long as it achieves the original objective, or maybe even achieves more than the original objective, the method is not important. And in the German way of war, this could go so far as disobeying direct orders, because as the commander on the ground, you saw an opportunity too good to ignore. Erwin Rommel would be famous for this, but he was by no means an exception. German soldiers of all ranks in the earlier years of World War II would often disobey or reinterpret orders due to the ever-changing situation at the front. This would change as the situation deteriorated and fascist doctrine of total control and fight to the last man took over, but even then, it still remained engraved in the Wehrmacht and to a lesser extent the Waffen-SS to adapt and be flexible, which ultimately is why the Germans did so well despite their hopeless situation. So, let's summarise. We have self-contained divisions that can operate independently. 
This is good because the Germans don't have a lot of trucks or tanks to begin with. All that they do have can be concentrated into one location and be relatively self-sufficient. And the men in command of those divisions have almost complete freedom to act on their own should a golden opportunity present itself. And these are factored into a doctrine which prioritizes breaking enemy lines and then essentially rushing to your objectives come hell or high water, encircling the enemy in the process. What you get from all this, and uh, forgive me for sounding like a Varibu, was simply the most effective military machine in the world at the time. But of course, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Like with all strategies, there are a few drawbacks. First is the fact, for this to work, you need the terrain to be cooperative. You need plenty of good roads and plenty of fields so you can maintain speed as well as a distinct lack of choke points, i.e. rivers, marshes, or dense forests. Furthermore, the distance you need to cover can't be too large, and you also need control of the air. Half of this doctrine derives its strength from surprise and hitting weak points. If the enemy can recon your position while denying your recon, or even worse, interdict your advance with strike aircraft, they can stop you from moving, which is a uh, kind of important in maneuver warfare. But above all, the biggest issue with this type of warfare is logistics. When your forces are moving hell for leather forward through enemy positions, bypassing strong points and so forth, their flanks will be weak and prone to counterattack. And until the infantry widen the advance behind them, this means your lines of supply are in danger. And that's not even addressing the fact that your resupply is now miles behind you and getting further away the longer you advance, making your situation increasingly tenuous the further you go. The Germans tried to compensate for this by making the bulk of their mobile divisions support and logistics units while a small, highly trained and well-equipped combat cadre at the front does double its share of the fighting. But one can imagine that logistics for this kind of warfare is a major pain in the ass. However, I'm going to save the logistical implications of all of this until later, because A, it's contextual, and B, it's such a clusterfuck it's going to need its own section. But okay. I have given you guys all of this information without saying a single word about the Tiger or indeed any German tanks. Why is that? This is a video about the Tiger after all. Well, the reason is I need you guys to understand the context as to exactly why the Tiger was so special and unique. And you also need to know the mindset of those who made her. Because by all accounts, the Tiger went against almost every ounce of what I've said above. And yet it makes perfect sense as to why. Because guess what, guys? It's that time. September 1st, 1939. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! They are the poster elite, bold to compete, never retreat. Never too early for gratuitous sabaton. Anyway. During the annexation of Austria, the Germans had refined the optimum balance for support vehicles to panzers after hard-won field experience. Uh, long story short, half their tanks broke down during the annexation. This, of course, was further reinforced by their occupation of Czechia. Here is the divisional template again of the uh, 1939 Panzer Division, just to refresh your memories. As you can see, the tanks only make up one line of the table of organization. The rest are all support elements and infantry. And during their conquest of Poland, they did some serious damage. However, the invasion of Poland wasn't so much a demonstration of Blitzkrieg in any real sense, other than it was an overwhelming smackdown, achieved with air supremacy and a vastly superior amount of combat power. And after winning that campaign, with the help of some sketchy and totally legit diplomacy, they prepared to embark on an offensive in the West. Originally, they were going to go with a similar plan to their original attempt at conquering France, presenting the Schlieffen plan, now with the added benefit of the internal combustion engine. But uh, due to a pilot getting lost and crashing in Belgium with a full set of the plans, the Allies now know everything. Not that it took a genius, because uh, they had guessed as much, considering that the alternative is to go straight through the Maginot line, and in the immortal words of someone with a very similar name to Maginot... <laughs> Oh, fuck no! 
But while all this was happening, and without the Panthers' involvement to any significant degree, Germany secured its iron ore trade with Sweden by occupying Norway and Denmark, which went well, uh, for the most part. <laughs> Honestly, at this point, I just pity the Kriegsmarine. But yes, the plans had been compromised, so they needed a new plan. And it's here that we see Erik von Manstein come into the picture. And he says, hey boys, here's the thing. The Allies think we're going to go schliefening. What if we only do a half schliefen? The Allies will rush forward to meet us in the Netherlands. When they do, we attack through the Arden Forest, which the Allies, and until recently all of us, thought was impossible to do with tanks. Now, the German High Command quite rightly said that this was an absolutely apocalyptically stupid idea that goes against all military logic. There are barely any roads, impassable terrain, and if the Allies find out, their artillery and air power can destroy our entire armoured force while they're trapped on these aforementioned narrow roads. However, Manstein countered that it's precisely because this plan is so mind-bogglingly stupid that it will work, because no one would be absolutely moronic enough to try it. We would catch them completely by surprise and drive to the English Channel behind them, cutting off the elite British and French forces, leaving only their reserves and secondary divisions trapped behind our main lines, unable to save their friends. This plan was named the Sickle Cut, and after showing it to the uh, world's most successful art school dropout since Vincent van Gogh, who in character loved the idea, the plan was adopted, and at the head of the Sickle itself were Heinz Guderian and Erwin Rommel. Now, at this time, most of the available German tanks were a collection of older models or training vehicles. The Panzer I was a lightly armoured vehicle armed with only machine guns, while the Panzer II was a slightly heavier and more heavily armed tank with a 20mm autocannon. Both of these tank designs were inferior to most of the vehicles operated by the British and French, but luckily there were three new types available in limited quantity which could make up for these shortcomings. First was what was intended to be the main battle tank of the Wehrmacht, the Panzer III. With decent armour and a 37mm KWK 36 main gun, this vehicle was one of the best designs in the world at the time, and had great capability. But it would be overshadowed by what became the main battle tank of the Wehrmacht. The Panzer IV started life as an infantry support tank, intended to fulfil the role that would eventually, and rather ironically, given that it used the Panzer III chassis, became the Stug III's job. The Panzer IV had a 75mm KWK-37 howitzer as its main gun, with a large supply of HE rounds. However, given the size and power of the gun, it was still useful against vehicles except for the heaviest enemy tanks. And finally, we have, um... Actually, you know what? I think I'm just going to bring in the flu for this one. God, she's great. But she didn't mention the gun, though. The gun on the Panzer 38T was a 37mm Czech anti-tank gun. Now, the more observant among you may have noticed what I'm going to say already. If you look at all these tanks, what do they have in common? They're all medium tanks. Now granted, the Panzer 1 and 2 are light tanks technically, but by the standards at the time, they were still relatively punchy. And they were known to be merely a development phase rather than actual combat vehicles. The 38T, the 3 and the 4 meanwhile all had decent armour for the time, decent guns, but most of all, they were all fast. Ideal for manoeuvring around the enemy and wiping out rear echelon units, or if push came to shove, shooting into the weaker side and rear armour of the heavier tanks. You can see what I'm getting at, can't you? German tank design was consciously heading into what would eventually become the main battle tank concept. A focus on balancing firepower, armour and mobility, with a particular emphasis on the mobility component. In fact, 
All German armoured vehicles had this focus, from the half-tracks to the scout cars. We need to move fast, and we need to move now. And uh, that is exactly what they did. On the 10th of May, Case Yellow began. German troops began advancing into the Low Countries rapidly, while paratroopers seized key bridges and forts along the main invasion routes. The Luftwaffe achieved air supremacy in a matter of hours, wiping out the Dutch and Belgian air forces on the ground along with a decent chunk of the RAF and the Army de la Air. The Allies immediately sprung into action at this eventuality, advancing all of their forces onto the various river fronts in Belgium and Holland, eagerly awaiting the German advance. And they were rewarded with exactly that. A German armoured vanguard supported by heavy air assets was rolling through Holland and Belgium. Although it was weird because the Allies could have sworn the Germans had more tanks than this. And of course they did. Later on during the campaign, Allied pilots reported large columns of German armour heading through the Ardennes forest. But these reports were dismissed because such terrain was impassable to tanks. And that's true. If you're using big heavy infantry support tanks like the Matildas or the Shah 1Bs. But what if you had engineers with you? And what if you had lighter vehicles? And what if all your support elements had come with you as well? The Germans broke through the light allied defences in the Ardennes and started heading for the English Channel. By day three they had reached the River Meuse, the major river between them and the open plains of northern France. After a daring combined assault with Stuka strikes and tank guns pinning the French defenders while infantry stormed across in assault boats under the cover of a smoke screen, Rommel's 7th Panzer Division made it across the river. In fact, Rommel himself could be seen firing a light machine gun under French counterattack while directing the operation personally, and once the crossing was made, he could be seen helping engineers lash the pontoon bridge together to allow the tanks to cross. Once Rommel got his tanks across the river, and against orders, he assembled his entire division and charged after the retreating French. In doing so, he essentially shattered the entire French 2nd Army Corps, taking 10,000 prisoners for the loss of only 36 men. He had moved so fast that neither the Allies or the German High Command for that matter knew where he was. The 7th Panzer Division just seemingly appeared at will, demolishing all in its path. For this, they earned a nickname. Ghost Division. But in doing their mad dash forward, they had left their flanks exposed. The infantry just simply couldn't catch them. The Allies were in disarray. They were almost totally beaten. But they still had a large number of reserve divisions. They, unlike the Germans, had lots of vehicles. But their tanks were heavier and slower to move, thus they hadn't even been moved up with the other formations during their rush through the Low Countries. Recognising how overextended the Germans were, they planned to cut off Rommel and Guderian, thus rescuing the BEF and the only professional French troops by taking Arras. And it is here, finally, after all of that build-up, where the story of Nazi Germany's most infamous tank begins. You see, when the Allies attacked, they attacked with Matildas, Soma 35s and Shah 1Bs, the Germans, realising the tenuous nature of their advance, dug in at the spearhead while wheeling their mobile forces around to meet the attack. The Panzer 3s and 4s, along with the infantry's anti-tank guns, engaged the Allied armoured formations and noted, to their horror, that their rounds just bounced harmlessly off them. Again and again, their 37mm rounds smacked dead on to the Allied tanks, and uh, every time, they were either stopped dead or just ricocheted off. The SS Tottenkopf Division, the mightiest and proudest of the Aryan race, ran like the little small dick bitches they were as Allied tanks smashed through their lines. It was only the professionalism of the Panzer troops and the innovative thinking of their commander that prevented disaster. The Schutzen regiments attached to 7th Panzer had been ordered to keep their 88mm anti-aircraft guns close to the front, both to dissuade Allied aircraft as well as to serve in the heavy anti-tank role. Rommel had been toying with the idea of integrating anti-tank weapons into his mobile units, something which he would become famous for later. And as the British tanks advanced, the 88s tore them to shreds. 
Meanwhile, the French advanced and uh, they got lost during the night and attacked the British instead, killing a British AT crew for the loss of a couple of Soma 35s. <sighs> the French army. Uh, eventually, though, they did find the Germans, but by that time the battle was over and uh, a bit past their involvement. The Germans, victorious, prepared to resume their drive, but then, in one of the most controversial decisions in military history, they were told to hold their position. The Panzer leaders were rightly furious and protested, but the attack on their flanks had given the more traditionalist officers, as well as the mustachioed madman, a panic attack. This would contribute, of course, to the British successfully retreating from Dunkirk and Guderian's doctor running out of blood pressure medication. But ultimately, it wouldn't really matter in the short term. Following the British retreat, the French army disintegrated, and after more Ghost Division shenanigans, Rommel reached the channel and then cruised along down it. With an outstanding, astonishing advance to Cherbourg from Rouen, he made 150 miles in 24 hours. The French, completely defeated, surrendered on June 22nd, 1940, ending what is probably the most successful campaign in modern military history. But the Panzerwaffe, despite winning the most hotly contested Tour de France in years, had nevertheless been given a wake-up call. Both their ultimate triumph and their tactical successes had been achieved through superior doctrine and training with a little bit of luck and a lot of air support, not to mention superior morale. Their tanks had been inferior to the Allied designs. If a proper head-to-head -head confrontation of armour were to happen, unless their gear got an upgrade, they'd be up shit creek. Thankfully, there's not much likelihood of that. After all, we've defeated the French. The British have to give up now. That said, for some reason, even though it's the day of our glorious victory, the date June 22nd gives me a strange feeling of foreboding and dread. Eh, it's probably nothing. So the British didn't give up. Shocker. Apparently having the world's largest navy and the world's first integrated air defence network makes you very hard to invade. It also helps when the head of the Luftwaffe is a moronic disgrace to humanity who's more interested in plundering the finest example of a civilised culture which he would never be worthy of in a millennium instead of leading and trusting his highly trained and competent subordinates. Anyway. Thanks to the aforementioned incompetent useless idiot, Britain is still in the fight, meaning Germany has no access to international trade, and an enemy who, given time, will be able to outproduce and overpower them with all the resources and manpower of the British Empire. It was a simple equation. The British with their empire, as well as good relations with the United States, let alone the Americans actually joining the conflict, had a theoretical combat power unattainable by the Wehrmacht. Even if Germany sat still and the Americans stayed out of the war, defeat was inevitable. The clock was ticking. They only had one option other than surrender. Seize the resources and slave labour required to operate without the constraints of international shipping lanes, which meant one thing conquering the Soviet Union. While preparations for Operation Barbarossa were underway, Germany was forced to rescue their useless allies. The Italians had invaded half the Mediterranean, only for the Mediterranean's occupants to promptly throw them back out. Unlike last time, where the disciplined juggernaut of the legions brought civilization, this time we had an army which resupplied its troops with uh, 20,000 pairs of boots, all of them left-footed. Yes, that is a true story. As such, German forces occupied the Balkans and Greece, 
while dispatching Rommel with a small mobile force that would later become known as the Africa Corps. And again, while succeeding in all of these ventures, the victories were won through air power and superior tactics. Their tanks, while more up to date when compared to their 1940s designs, were still inferior to that of the British heavy tanks. The Panzerwaffe lobbied the Waffenamt, the German Arms Appropriations Committee, for new tanks to combat the British designs. Tanks with better armour, decent mobility, but above all, better guns. And so, on the 26th of May 1941, a request was put to the two heavy hitters in German heavy vehicle design. Both Porsche and Henschel were told to submit prototypes for a 45-ton heavy tank capable of mounting the 88mm KWK-36 anti-tank gun. The vehicle was intended to be used in breakthrough operations and have the ability to counter British heavy infantry support tanks. Both companies had been working on heavy tank designs in anticipation of this request after the feedback received from the Panzer crews post-Blitzkrieg, and so development time was curtailed significantly. With that in mind, the due date was set for June of 1942. By that time, Germany should have the resources of the conquered USSR to work with, allowing for mass production of the new vehicle to stand off against the inevitable British invasion. And speaking of invasions, boys and girls, it's time for the main event! On June 22nd, 1941, one year exactly after the French surrender, German troops embarked on the largest campaign in military history. The single largest war of all time, so far at least, was now underway. And it was a total rout. Stalin, in his infinite wisdom, had been exporting all sorts of raw material to the Nazis over the past half a decade, and had killed all of his senior officers, fearing a coup that wasn't even real, and then after launching a poorly planned Pyrrhic war in Finland, decided to mass his troops on the German border with the full intent of invading at the opportune moment, once his army had been rebuilt in a year or two. However, if you cast your mind back to the German way of war, that being exploitation of weak points in line, followed by rapid encirclement, what would be the worst tactic? Could it possibly be bunching up all of your units at the front line while your rear areas are all completely unguarded and filled with logistics and admin units? Hmm... War games, conducted by Zukov, established that even if the Soviets attacked first, their dispositions were at extreme risk of being encircled by German forces. Zhukov therefore recommended that the original fortified border pre-annexation of Poland, dubbed the Stalin Line, should be maintained while the NKVD border divisions and militia forces slow down the initial German advance. However, Stalin decided that the Germans wouldn't invade because Britain was still in the fight, and so the border should be fortified while they prepared to attack the Germans in 1943 or 1944. The result was a slaughter, with hundreds of thousands killed or captured within the first month. This was a cakewalk. The Germans were certain they'd be in Moscow by August. With encirclement after encirclement, the Red Army began to disintegrate. Or so it would seem, at any rate. If nothing else, one thing you can be sure of. Nobody can stop the mighty war machine of the Aryan Master... R hey. Wait a minute, you guys hear that? What the fuck are those? Oh, shite. The guns! The guns, they do nothing! The Soviets had tanks which absolutely no one expected. The T-34s and the KVs caused, in the words of Henschel's chief designer, 
extreme consternation as they were superior to any tanks currently available to the German army. Thus, the timetable needed to be accelerated. While the Panzer III's and Panzer IV's were upgunned, the due date for the new heavy tanks was set for the 20th of April 1942, Hitler's birthday. And the winner would be shifted into immediate serial production once the basic bugs were worked out. And they would definitely be needed, seeing as the Wehrmacht was now in the process of freezing to death, with no hope of victory in the East that year. Fun fact, the Germans did have winter clothing and winter equipment for their soldiers, but the logistics system in Russia was so bad, to ship it to the front they would have to take away from the ammunition and fuel shipments, which was the only thing keeping their frontline combat capable and alive. There was also the other darker part of that situation, which was the German general staff had ruled against supplying the troops with winter clothing during the initial invasion, as it would be seen as an admission that the summer campaign might fail, which for morale purposes, as well as political reasons, was deemed unacceptable. The great thing about fascist militarists is that the only thing they care more about than victory is their ego. Whether it be Japan, Italy, or the Nazis, they all make this mistake. Shit, even Stalin got over himself. Eventually. And speaking of egos, let's check in on our boy Porsche, because it's finally time to talk nitty-gritty technical details. Porsche, in his typical style, had been working on the potential prototypes for a heavy tank as early as 1939, having designed a heavier version of a medium tank proposal requested by the waffen armed designated VK-30.01. German geniuses like Porsche and Messerschmitt are tinkerers who have been given an unlimited budget. They always have 50 projects going at once, which made Erhard Misch and Elbert Speer have a stroke a bit later. But uh, things were going relatively well at this point, besides the whole Russian winter without a jacket thing, so no one actually cares right now. However, this time round it was actually a bit easier, as Krupp had already designed a turret to fit the 88mm gun, so all they really needed to do was have a tank to attach it to. But Porsche, during the middle of this cataclysmic global conflict, ceasing all international trade, wanted to go all in. He wanted to go the full Lamborghini two decades before Lamborghini would even exist. He wanted compressed air-assisted braking. He wanted a forward-mounted turret to allow for not one, but two engines. Two V10s operated through a linked throttle. But this was small time. No, 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 no. He didn't want these just to power the vehicle. No, no, no. He wanted to take the state-of-the-art electric motor technology fitted to Germany's U-boats. You know, the tech that takes up the entire aft section of a fleet-class submarine requiring a small team of engineers to run and maintain. He wanted to miniaturize that technology with an experimental design and then use those electric motors to power the tracks via the power generated via the gasoline or diesel engines. Power which had to go through a massive fuck-off generator before he even got to the electric motors. So, think about this. Gasoline electric transmission, which is basically two engines powering a generator which then powers two electric engines. <sighs> there were advantages to this, of course. The gearbox and transmission would be replaced in this setup by a three-stage speed switch, powering the drive wheels at the rear of the tank, meaning the vehicle would be easy to drive and have a higher top speed, as seen here in this colorized documentary footage. <laughs> But of course, spoiler alert, we know that this design wasn't adopted, so there is an incoming but. And, uh, well... The Porsche Tiger. People really into tanks love this one. But it digs into the earth really easily. And it overheats. And catches fire. It's known for breaking easily. Oh man, we did it again! Hey Hoshino, put it out! Funny thing about using experimental technology in what's supposed to be a serial production tank within months of adoption, not to mention technology that uses a lot of copper, which is a rare metal, the thing we're finding this whole war to get. It's expensive to make, expensive to run, requires a ton of maintenance to both work and keep working, and if that wasn't enough, 
has a tendency to just break or catch fire, rendering that highly technical classified super expensive weapon system a rather imposing lawn ornament. A cool lawn ornament to be sure, but when there are shells and machine gun bullets directed at you, evacuating it would not be fun. And given that vehicle fires require evacuation, they are something you want to be a purely enemy-inflicted hazard rather than an occupational one. Other than that, there is nothing really more notable about this prototype other than the distinctive wheel configuration. Most advanced German armour would have interleaved road wheels, with some of them being powered to propel the vehicle, while this one maintained individual wheels in sets of two, along with the torsion bar suspension and drive sprockets, which I guess is a plus considering that it would be easy to change the tracks on this model. However, to be honest, that's offset by the whole spontaneous combustion and literally everything else breaking thing. But not to worry. Porsche is so confident that he's got his contract on lock, he's ordered serial production already, churning out 100 holes in preparation for deployment. But oh no. He has some stiff competition. Because as we know looking in retrospect, the Henschel company has a tank comparable in performance and even better... It works. Alongside Porsche, Henschel too had been contracted to develop the various medium and heavy tank projects throughout the lead up and early years of the war. The one mentioned earlier, Project VK 30.01, was one that Henschel had committed quite heavily to, with four hulls being made for testing and evaluation. Two of the hulls, surviving the testing and subsequent cancellation of the project, would both be developed into what was known as the Stur Emil tank destroyers named Max and Moritz, both of which would be lost on the Eastern Front, with the Soviets capturing Moritz at Stalingrad and later preserving him in the Kubienka Tank Museum. Point is, Henschel had a practical design philosophy going forward, and their later VK-3601 project, which resembles an almost miniature Tiger, is evidence of that. To Henschel, the task was a simple one. Find the biggest tank components currently in serial production in Germany, Assemble them together to be compatible with Krupp's turret, put them in a massive armor-plated box, and hey presto, you have one fuck-off huge heavy tank. In fact, it was a really heavy tank. While Porsche's Tiger had gone for the high-end and sleek approach, Henschel went in with a sledgehammer. Granted, it was a highly engineered German sledgehammer, but it was a sledgehammer nonetheless. The Henschel Tiger came in a full 10 tons heavier than Porsche's design, a total of 57 tons at combat weight. In terms of armour protection, while it wasn't sloped armour, it made up for that in sheer thickness. The front armour of the Tiger was 100mm thick, that's uh, 4 inches for those of you who use freedom units, and 120mm thick on the gun mantlet. Side armour was 60mm thick, while the upper hull and side turret were 80mm thick. The roof, however, was only 25mm thick, resistant to small arms and AT rifles, but not much else. To improve effectiveness on the armour, the Tiger crews would often angle their tank at a 30 to 45 degree angle relative to the enemy in order to maximise armour performance, essentially achieving the slope that the armour itself lacks. However, protection isn't what this thing is best at, despite being what it's famous for. Other than breaking down, but we'll get to that. The 88mm gun on this bad boy was a dedicated anti-tank 88. The KWK-36 had an insanely flat shell trajectory over long distances, combined with a shell that had the ballistic properties of a semi-trailer going three times the speed of sound. Short of the infamous railway guns or self-propelled German infrastructure removers that the Soviets made later, such as the ISU-152, the gun on the Tiger was simply silly. It could murder anything in the Allied arsenal from a distance rendering the Tiger itself impervious to enemy fire. In open country, there was simply nothing that could touch it until the IS-2 and the Pershing arrived at the very end of the war. And given the fact that it had German optics, namely a TZF-9... I'm not even going to attempt that shit. Which, as I established in my Bismarck video, which you should go watch if you haven't already allows you to see individual fleas on a dog at 10 miles. This made the Tiger's gun ridiculously accurate. British tests post-war had it routinely hitting a 16 by 18 inch target at a distance of 3,600 feet away, 
or a 410 by 460 millimeter target at 1.1 kilometers away for those of us who live in the civilized world. But now for the fun part. As stated above, the Henschel design was more conventional than that of the Porsche design. But lest we forget that we are discussing German engineering here. And so while it was an absolute masterpiece of what technology can achieve, and while it was the pinnacle of said conventional technology, it also meant that you needed the right parts, hours of training, large amounts of money, and endless resources to refine the components to precise tolerances. In short, let's talk about the shit that broke. Now I'm being a little harsher than I need to be if I'm being honest, but one can't deny that the Tiger's history is one of great combat success that caused logisticians and operations officers to consider whether a 9mm leave pass was a superior option. Let's talk about the engine. The engine was, rather hilariously given the reputation for German technical superiority, an accident. You see, besides the really dumb design for Porsche's petrol-electric drive thing, he actually had a good reason for using two diesel engines, as they were smaller than one big engine. Now why is that important? Well, you see, the Germans hadn't built a big enough diesel engine that had sufficient power to drive the new Wonder Panzer. Not to mention a shortage of diesel, which is ironic considering how much a tank of this size will use. I mean, technically a U-boat engine could do it, but, you know, weight and space. So they used a gasoline engine. The 21.35 litre 12 cylinder Maybach HL210, making 650 horsepower. However, that was amazingly not enough to haul the tank properly, and the drivers kept breaking it, which is technically user error. But again, we are coming up to late 1942, and making your tank more user friendly is going to be important, considering your drivers are very soon going to be either the older technophobe demographic or the just out of Hitler Youth Camp demographic. In fact, the Hitler Youth did raise their own tank division, the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend. So after the first 250 Tigers were made, they upgraded to the Maybach HL230, which was the same engine but used a cast iron engine block, which meant they could make the engine chunkier. We're up to 700 horsepower now, which is uh, still not enough given that the comparable Allied tanks had better, but I guess even the Germans have to pay attention to mechanical and economic realities on occasion. Then again, they built their big scary tank before everyone else, so they get a couple years head start. This engine, through a drivetrain, powered the infamous Tiger transmission located near the driver, mounted low in the front, which in turn drove the front sprockets and ran the tracks. Meanwhile, steering and operation had gotten quite the upgrade with a hydraulic semi-automatic pre-selected gearbox with 8 gears in total. A very powerful ring brake to allow for the stopping of such a large vehicle, even while going at high speed, and even, would you believe it, a steering wheel. But what was really special was the steering itself making use of a double differential linked into the gears, meaning that despite being such a sizable tank, the Tiger could be rather nimble when it needed. However, more importantly, when shifted into neutral gear, the tracks could be independently powered in opposite directions, giving the Tiger neutral traverse. The ability to pivot in place without moving. This was something that not many World War II tanks could do. It was essentially only the later model German and British vehicles that could do this. And while it put strain on the engine, transmission and tracks, it allowed for some crazy manoeuvres. Tiger ace Michael Wittmann, who we will talk about later, used this capability while simultaneously using the higher RPM to spin the turret, allowing for the fastest traverse speed possible. Speaking of turret traverse, in the movies, the Tiger has been given a bad rap when it comes to turret traverse speed, but in reality it was actually quite impressive. The Sturm L4 hydraulic motor was linked into the main engine of the vehicle via a secondary drive shaft and allowed for a 6 degree per second traverse. Now that isn't that fast, taking 5 minutes to do a 360 degree sweep. However, because it's linked into the engine, when the RPMs on the main engine are higher, the gunner could switch traverse into a high speed mode meaning consequentially under the right engine conditions, the turret could be traversed progressively faster depending on the vehicle's RPM. Hence, as we see here, with a Maho's epic skills. So if you are driving along on an attack and sight a target, the gunner could slew the turret around at up to 36 degrees a second, call the driver to halt, acquire the target, and shoot. 
This shit works in reverse too, which, again, due to the higher RPMs, allows him to acquire and engage targets effectively during a retreat, and in the case of a really experienced crew, such as Vitman's, they can do that while moving. This tank is a monster. It's so cool. But, like all Veribu fantasies, they are precisely that. Fantasies. Because, besides the transmission braking, besides the engine being sensitive until the upgrade, and even then it still needed proper maintenance regularly, even under combat conditions to keep running, despite all of that, there is one major part of the Tiger that undermines everything else. Now, ask yourselves, dear viewers, what is the weakest part of a tank? What is the thing that you shoot at when literally nothing else is working? Uh... The tracks? The tracks! Gold started that man in the third row! Yes! The Tiger had 16 torsion bar suspension, 8 bars aside, with alternating swing arms to save space. Looking good so far. Nothing amiss here. Very cool. And then... They fuck it up. Remember how I said that the Porsche Tiger's track layout was weird for late war German tanks? Due to the weight of the vehicle and its size, Henschel wanted to make the weight distribution as even as possible across the tracks, which is why the Tiger, like mentioned earlier, was designed to use interleaved road wheels. Now, if you look at this uh, handy quick little montage here, tell me what you don't see on literally any modern tracked vehicle. Bingo. Now, I hear you ask, but you said it's more efficient, Pac-Man. Why wouldn't it be used on modern vehicles? Well, imagine, if you will, you're under fire. Shells are whizzing past. Your Tiger is impervious to most arms, so they take out your tracks to mobility kill you. Now, while you are impervious to what they're shooting at you, if you can't move, they can bring in artillery, which can go up to, you know... 150 millimeter shells, so that can kill you. Or they can bring in air power to launch a precision strike. Or, even better, the infantry can close and engage with either manpats, that being man portable anti tank like a bazooka or a panzer shrek, or even a satchel charge and demo blocks. So you need to fix said track to survive. Or even if you are just on a movement to a staging area and your track breaks, in combat, time is probably the most crucial factor. The tank's big advantage is that it is a bunker that can move. And with this wheel set up, to change the tracks you have to remove both the tracks and, depending where the damage is, half the wheels as well. But away! It gets better. The interleaved wheels and their subsequent sensitive tolerances meant that any damage required real replacement, but it's not just damage you have to worry about but environmental and logistics factors as well. In poor terrain, like deep snow or quagmire-like mud, the Tiger was extremely susceptible to wheel jams. The Russian mud season, known as the Rasputitsa, was especially nasty, as seen in this photo here. And as such, every time it occurred, they had to pull everything off, clear it up, and then put it all back. And this went as far as the strategic redeployment of the tank. Yes, even when nothing was happening, even when they were just moving it from one place to another, due to the width of the tracks, the Tiger could not be transported on the standard rail gauge without modification, as the track edges extend too far out, given that the vehicle is so wide. As such, when being redeployed via rail, every Tiger had to have its outermost wheels removed and special transport tracks fitted which would take uh, 30 minutes to an hour on each vehicle. However, of course, the saner mines prevailed and the German E4 Mafia intervened and would usually check to see if there were any tunnels on the route. If there weren't, they would uh, violate standing orders, which is, you know, standard, and leave the combat tracks on so they could just roll the tanks right off. That was a problem the crews could sort of work around. They could sort of get around those pesky little rules and regulations and adapt to the situation. The other problem was something they couldn't work around. That being the laws of physics. They're a bitch like that. Given the Tiger weighed 57 tons, the tank was so heavy that it was actually unable to cross one third of all the bridges in Europe. 
Whereas when you want to do a Blitzkrieg, an operation based on speed and maneuver, is kind of a kick in the dick. Fortunately though, the design team thought of this. While Porsche's Tiger was designed to make use of U-boat technology, the Henschel team decided that the simplest solution to cross rivers was for the Tiger not to simply emulate the U-boat. The Tiger was to become the U-boat. Genius. The rear compartments of the vehicle were able to be flooded. This was to be combined with a large complex snorkel assembly and ventilation system, while a giant rubber donut yes, you heard that correctly, was inflated like a floaty around the turret ring to make it airtight, allowing the tank to, in theory, ford bodies of water at least up to 15 feet or 4.5 metres deep. I don't have any sources on how many Tiger prototypes gave their lives to test this, but I'll tell you why I wouldn't want to try it. However, people uh, rightly assessed that the amount of setup time, equipment, the expense, logistical requirement, and most of all the risk of drowning was not worth the effort, and only 495 of the Tigers were ever fitted with this system before it was removed from production. All that said, however, the Tiger I was a truly magnificent design for its time. In fact, I think what Jeremy Clarkson famously says about Alfa Romeo's applies as here as well. When the Germans design a tank, they designed a tank to be as good as a tank can be, briefly. Besides, it's not like we're starving for resources, trained manpower, and have a huge budget and trade deficit. I mean, what's the harm in building a tank that costs four times that of our most effective armoured fighting vehicle, the Stug 3? You know, the thing that's getting a kill-death ratio of like 10 to 1 and we can mass-produce... Uh... <coughs> And so, in August of 1942, the Panzerkampfwagen 6 Tiger was put into production, and despite a few changes over time, such as the famous Zimmerit paste and smoke canister launches, its iconic, blocky, angry shape remained a source of terror for Allied and Soviet crews, until its bigger, scarier descendant appeared, striking terror into every gearbox in Germany before it caught fire and everybody laughed. And, as if it foretold the coming of weeb tank enthusiasts, the user manual, the Tiger Fibel, came complete with scantily clad 2D women and a series of cheesy jokes and catchy rhymes to make sure the crews learned how to operate their vehicle. Well, it obviously worked on the weeb front anyway, since the Japanese bought one. But given they had some logistical issues of a certain enterprising kind. Getting it back to Japan proved difficult, and so in a beautifully hilarious piece of red tape, the Japanese leased the tiger they bought back to the Wehrmacht. <laughs> Fucking hell. Ultimately, 1,347 Tiger 1s would be built. 18 of these hulls would be converted into the Sturm Tiger assault gun, while Porsche's 100 useless hulls would be converted to the Ferdinand or the Elephant, tank destroyer, which didn't help much on the useless front as they were a pile of shit, but they certainly looked cool. And thus, there in the scorching flames of the Ruhr Valley's steel forges and the towering caverns of Henschel's factory, an illustrious Korea was born. You know what time it is, boys. Cue the Sabaton! Death in the shape of a Panzer Battalion! Okay, so I know that song is about Operation Iraqi Freedom, but Tiger units were deployed in their own dedicated heavy tank battalions, and the song's an absolute banger, so fuck it. Speaking of, those independent tank battalions have this handy little table of organisation. Pretty nice, huh? Due to the Tigers being such a powerful weapon system, while also being very limited in number, the Germans couldn't feel entire divisions of them. As such, they were treated as strategic level assets to be attached to units in need of their services, rather than as a default line unit. Now those among you who are paying attention can see the headache this poses right off the bat. The Tiger's logistical woes, coupled with the absolute shit show that was the German logistics system in general, which uh, Tick, a famous historian, thinks that anarcho-capitalism is the answer to solving, made redeployments very difficult. Just to give you guys an idea regarding how bad German logistics was, the German army's total truck production across 1939 to 1942 was, to make a swag or a scientific wild-ass guess, in the uh, 15 to 20,000 range, and I'm 
pretty sure I'm being generous there, but that's just me spitballing. Point is, it was not huge. They didn't have enough trucks, basically. Now, consider that they are suffering a rubber shortage and a fuel shortage, and they are supporting an army that's in the 4 million personnel range, along with the Luftwaffe. To be blunt, it's impossible with just their domestic tank production and their domestic truck production. They don't have enough vehicles. So, how do they handle it? They rob every country in Europe for their trucks, except for their Fords. The Fords are purchased as Henry willingly sells them to them. As seen with this Ford truck during Operation Barbarossa right here. But the long and short of it is, the German army in 1941 and 1942 embarked on the largest invasion of human history, with about 12 to 14 different types of truck, each of them with their own unique spares, service life, design features and flaws, etc. And given that the Soviet rail gauge is different from European rail gauge, and the Soviets scorch earth anything they can't take, so the Germans can't capture Soviet rolling stock, they also have to relay the entirety of the Soviet rail net. And with all of this going on, you decide that you're going to field the most technically advanced weapon system in the world, which is notorious for having highly sensitive tolerances. <sighs> the result was that once Tigers were posted somewhere, it was a huge operation to redeploy them, and it couldn't be done quickly. As a result, they tended to be bound by theatre of operation, but in a sense of happy misfortune, the Eastern Front was exactly where they needed to be anyway. However, their debut would not be the most glamorous, for you see the Charlie Chaplin-looking motherfucker in Berlin wanted to make use of his new toy and ordered them deployed before any serious combat trials had been performed to determine employment and field performance. So of all the places for the Tiger to be deployed, they were sent north to Leningrad. Now, here is a map of Leningrad, or St. Petersburg as it's known today. Notice the terrain. Swamp, swamp, city, town, forest, forest, swamp. Oh, look, rivers. Lots and lots of rivers. In fact, that's a fucking shitload of rivers. Now, this is a tank. They could only cross certain bridges and terrain due to its weight. It's experimental. Which means its crews haven't had a chance to work with it and, uh, you know, work it out. And both its armor profile and gun are optimally suited to long-range engagements. And this area is entirely forest, swamp, or urban environments. So what happened? Well, uh, the Tigers rolled along the front line of Army Group North and the Leningrad perimeter. No real big engagements of note occurred. However, the Tiger Company suffered incredibly from engine breakdowns. They were going through transmissions and gearboxes like the JDM drift scene, only with um, more hostile reception. The crews had uh, not worked out the 210 engines yet and were killing their vehicles. What's worse is that due to the terrain, they had to use the narrow Russian roads, making proper offensive operations with their gigantic heavy tiger tanks virtually impossible however virtually impossible is not actually impossible so they did try assaulting a soviet position the tigers formed line and advanced however in going off road to form this attack formation one of the vehicles immediately bogged down while trying to cover their comrades and perhaps recover the vehicle the soviets seeing this immediately began hitting the small unit of tigers with literally everything they had the Germans, quite sensibly, decided that this was not a wonderful place to be and withdrew, abandoning the vehicle. And so, after all of that build-up, all of that hype, all of the amazing hope the Germans had for their new, illustrious Wunderwaffe, the great wonder weapon to defeat the Soviets once and for all, the first combat action of this illustrious weapon, the Panzerkampfwagen 6 Tiger, achieved precisely one thing handing their brand new super tank completely intact and functional to the Soviet Union. Upon its capture, Soviet NKVD intelligence troops immediately seized it for testing, shipping it to the Red Army proving grounds as fast as possible. Upon arrival at said proving grounds, they threw everything they had at it. I 
mean everything. There weren't enough kitchen sinks in Moscow for this fucking thing, right? They threw everything at it. And what resulted from these tests was the nomination of some poor bastard who had to go up to the big man Joe and say, and I am paraphrasing here, Hey boss, um, we've got nothing that works against this thing, like, at all. Wonder how long he lived. Should we investigate? Should you shut the fuck up before you get us both killed? Anyway, essentially... Soviet guns fitted to tanks, as well as general-purpose anti-tank guns, including the brand new Ziz-3, could do precisely, and I'm using a scientific term here, dick. They could do precisely dick to the Tiger, unless they had a flat angle and were really close. Only the self-propelled guns like the Su-152 or KV-2 stood any chance at all, and they were not numerous enough or even remotely suitable for an anti-tank role. Meanwhile, the Tiger could wipe out any Soviet vehicle or gun position with absolute impunity. This was, of course, the conclusion the British drew as well. After a reasonably successful debut in Tunisia, where the Tiger could operate in the open spaces it was designed for, British Churchill tanks of the 142nd Royal Armoured Corps moved to relieve a unit of the 2nd Battalion Sherwood Foresters dug in around the town of Guriel el Atak, Tunisia. Upon reaching the area, they found a beleaguered force of infantry trying to hold off a monstrous tank charging them down. The Churchills had arrived at just the right time, and they engaged with their six-pounders, to no effect. And so they advanced, and fired again. This time, three direct hits were scored, right in the middle of the vehicle. The turret on the Tiger started grinding and then stopped. Meanwhile, inside the vehicle, half the crew were wounded and their radio was destroyed. Realising their vehicle was combat ineffective without their turret and radio, the crew abandoned their Tiger and evacuated the wounded men. The British immediately captured the vehicle, and used spares from the other Tigers they had destroyed nearby to restore it to running order. It was later inspected by both King George VI and Winston Churchill, before it was sent home to the UK for extensive evaluation. This was, of course, Tiger 131, the only original Tiger in full working order that survives today. It starred in the movie Fury, the first appearance of a genuine Tiger on film since 1950, and is the pride and joy of Bobbington Tank Museum, where you can still see it today. But while all this had been going on, things had not exactly been going well for our one bollocked wonder in the Reichskanzlerie. Despite his new weapons coming on stream and the damage the German forces had been doing to British and Soviet forces, things were starting to unravel. The Americans finally decided they wanted in on this thing and landed in West Africa with hell on wheels and the big red run in front. They were being capably led by one George S. Patton. To the east, the British 8th Army, under the command of one of the most insufferable and annoying men in human history, Sir Bernard Montgomery, was pushing Rommel into a corner. But most critically of all, the entirety of the German 6th Army had been enveloped and destroyed in the frozen ruins of what was once the showpiece of the Soviet Union, the jewel on the Volga known as the city of Stalingrad. In the aftermath of that particular disaster, the Soviets launched an absolutely apocalyptic counterattack in two major sectors of the front. One of them was a spoiling attack to pin down the reserves from Army Group Center. This was around the city of Rzhev, and had been ongoing since the operation to surround Stalingrad was underway. This operation was known as Operation Mars. The main thrust, meanwhile, was aimed at the Don River Basin, with the goal of capturing Donetsk and Rostov-on-Don. If the Soviets could successfully take these cities, while the Germans were still falling back from the Caucasus Mountains and Stalingrad itself, they would essentially have cut off the entirety of Army Group South. As such, it was here that the bulk of the new Tigers were sent. Using them as a heavy reserve, our famous friend, Erich von Manstein, coordinated one of the finest fighting retreats in military history, eventually stopping the Russian offensive to the southwest of the embattled city of Kharkov. However, given what we know about Manstein and the German Panzer Corps in general, however, we know that this wasn't going to be enough for them. 
With a majority of premium replacements now being shifted to Army Group South, Tigers and Panzer IV Fs were arriving en masse, as Manstein was assigned the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, comprised of Das Reich, Totenkopf, and most notably of all, the Leimstandarte Arthaus Asshole. With these new formations, he counterattacked towards the city, cutting off and obliterating the Soviet armoured spearheads. The Soviets were sent reeling as with a combination of new hardware and ideological fanaticism, the SS divisions and their attached heavy panzer battalions began systematically eradicating everything in their path. And the situation for the defenders only got worse as alongside the SS panzer divisions, Manstein had sent in the Wehrmacht's Gross Deutschland division, the Wehrmacht's most elite and well-equipped formation. Combine all of this with a renewed Luftwaffe presence provided by Luftflotte 4, and you have a simply unstoppable force. By March 15th, Kharkov had been recaptured. The Soviets had lost 80,000 men to the Germans' 11,000. Generals Vertutin and Rokozovsky had been pushed right back out of Army Group South's AO. However, the Soviet forces to the north had gained far more success. Advancing steadily to the west, they had advanced all the way forward and created this situation. A huge bulge had formed around the city of Kursk. And this huge bulge in the Eastern Front, in keeping with the weird crossover between Nazis and fairies, yeah, this bulge was noticed. Ooh woo. Die! Extreme noses pounces on you, ooh woo, you're so warm. Ooh. Couldn't help but notice your bulge from across the floor. Noses your Nikki like you tell them or till they hee hee. Unzips your baggiest pants, oh baby, you so must care. Take me home, pet me, and make me yours, and don't forget to stuff me. See me like my little baby tail off for your bulgy bulgy. Who the fuck writes this shit? You know what? Fuck it. No, no, I, I can't believe that that joke made it into the script. How the fuck did that make it into the script? I don't give a fuck. It's bullshit. I hate it. Um. Did somebody say gratuitous sabaton? Into the motherland, the German army march. So here we are. The Kursk salient. Now, funny thing about the word salient. Do you know what its definition is? In language terms, it means the most important, or rather more accurately, the most noticeable. After the success of the Kharkov counteroffensive by Army Group South, the conspicuous... Bulge... had formed in the front line in between Army Group South and Army Group Centre. The Soviets had pushed numerous guards formations through the area, but when their comrades on the left flank had been routed, they found themselves rather exposed, spread out, and in front of the primary Soviet positions around the city of Kursk. Hence the salient's name. Now, given what we know about the German way of war, that is, to encircle the enemy forces with speed and aggression through concentration of force, what you think happened, did happen. The OKW and the OKH, as well as Mr. Fast and Furious himself, looked at the map and thought, Aha! The perfect place to attack! We'll pinch them off and crush them with our superior German might. Well, not everyone. Guderian asked him if he was delusional, considering the pressure they were under on the other fronts, while Albert Speer pointed out the fact that the Wehrmacht was simply not in a logistical position to undertake an offensive of that size. Even Myrtle, who was rather committed to the regime as well as stereotypes, I mean, check the monocle on this guy, even he was recommending an active defense with operations to hit on the counter later in the year. But they were, as usual, overruled. Boss man knew best after all, that's why he's in charge. That said, it was Manstein's plan and he had probably gotten a bit cocky after his big win at Kharkov, so the chief paper hanger can't be held completely accountable for this one. But, calling back to the definition of salient, the reason why the Wehrmacht had been so successful up to now is they had moved quickly with the initiative and kept the enemy off balance, not to mention they had used surprise to an extensive degree in all their major operations thus far. However, our German friends had forgotten, in their arrogance, that the angry Bolsheviks across the street 
also happen to have maps. And even better, they so happen to live here. And when the Stavka met to discuss its plans for the upcoming summer offensives, they looked at the map and went, Huh. Where do you think they're going to go? I don't know. Maybe right here, pointing to the massively obvious target to anyone with one brain cell. So they decided to dig in around Kursk while reinforcing it to all fuckery. Now, I want to point out here, just as a side note, because this isn't actually in the original script, the Germans did lobby uh, Mustache Man to actually launch the attack early, as they knew that the Russians would dig in if they didn't. However, he wanted all his super weapons ready to go, and so forced them to delay. So, there is that little tidbit. I thought I'd chuck that in there. Anyway, moving on, back to the Soviets. Yeah, they planted something like 400,000 mines. They also laid a thousand miles of barbed wire and trenches. Lots and lots and lots of fucking trenches. In fact, if you lined up all the trenches they dug, you could dig a continuous ditch from Moscow to Madrid. In fact, the Soviets were such mad lads, they actually trained sappers to lay mines in front of German tanks on the move. They would spontaneously lay minefields in front of the German advance. They're insane. They taught their AT gunners to shoot the barrels off enemy heavy tanks, for fuck's sake. They're nuts. The only chance the Germans had of even attempting this was, as I said before, to hit immediately before they were ready. But uh, the side fringe fascist wanted his new Panzer V Panthers to join in, so uh, yeah, didn't happen. Several months go by, and the Soviets are now so dug in, ExxonMobil is suing for copyright infringement and patent violations for their drilling, but the new Panthers have arrived, so the Russians shouldn't stand a chance. The offensive, now known as Operation Citadel, was ready to commence. The forces assembled here were something that really no one can comprehend. It may actually be the largest singular battle in human history. While Stalingrad and Verdun and the other large battles of modern history lasted so long, they could actually be considered campaigns rather than battles. The Battle of Kursk lasted just over a month, and during that month there was never a true lull in the fighting. It kept going for that entire month. In this moderately sized sector of the front lines, I mean by Eastern Front standards, in this little bulge right here, Three and a half million men, 10,000 tanks, and 5,000 planes fought a bitter struggle to the death. And on July the 5th, 1943, that struggle began. The Soviets, having heard the engines starting and having seen the Germans mobilizing along the front, had a guess as to where the enemy assembly areas were and raked them with Katusha barrages. The result was devastating. But the Germans, not perturbed by this, began their assault, with practically all the heavy panzers in their arsenal, tigers, elephants and panthers now available, all of the heavy tanks available to the Wehrmacht were right here, this battle was the showdown. And with such weapons and the superior Aryan race at the helm, how could it fail? Yep. Despite making some early inroads, the Germans eventually hit what can only be described as the Great Wall of Ivan, getting horribly bogged down and eventually stopped cold, which of course leads to... The Soviet counterattack was absolutely ferocious slamming into the forward elements of the panzer divisions in the typical Soviet sledgehammer style. The 503rd and 505th heavy tank battalions got to work and began cutting down T-34s like scythes through a wheat field, but the sheer number of Soviet tanks was beginning to wear them down. It must be said here, however, that the Tigers' performance during the Battle of Kursk was exemplary, and it was their presence which made the difference between a defeat and a total rout. The Panther having been rushed into service, was suffering numerous technical issues, with a serviceability rate that got as low as 16%. The Ferdinand tank destroyers, meanwhile, had achieved excellent combat results in the open plains in stationary firing positions, so basically when they were used as giant anti-tank guns, 
but couldn't partake in any of the serious offensive actions due to their transmissions breaking on a 5 degree incline or their engines spontaneously combusting. Any attempt to manoeuvre or reposition them also resulted in breakdowns so severe they rendered the vehicle totally inoperable. When you combine this with the prolific use of AT mines from the Soviet defenders, the result was embarrassing. The 653rd Heavy Panzerjäger Battalion started the battle with 45 Ferdinands, and by the end of combat, on the first day, they were down to 12. Of all the wonder tanks Germany had assembled to save the Reich, only the Tigers were working. And during this Titanic clash, there were countless moments. But for brevity, I will talk about the two most famous ones. The first was, of course, the Battle of Prokhorovka. By the 12th of July 1943, the German offensive had reached its zenith. The Soviets had worn them down and stopped them. Now all that was left was to counterattack, and it was General Rodmistrov's 5th Guards tank army that was assigned the task. At 8.30 in the morning after an artillery barrage, 500 Soviet tanks with their infantry riding on their backs charged down the German positions, raining hellfire from their guns as they went. Their attack was so horrific that it looked like it would succeed, but unfortunately for the Soviets, the elements they were facing were the SS Panzer Divisions of 2nd SS Panzer Corps. And in the lead was the most elite unit of the German ground units, the aforementioned Leibstandarte Art School Reject, 1st SS Panzer. The lead elements of the Soviet attack were wiped out, losing 62 tanks and forcing them back. This drove the 18th Soviet Tank Corps to attempt a flanking manoeuvre around them, with the goal of, as the youth call it today, pulling an Obi-Wan. I have the high ground! However, there was a rather distinct problem with that, as on that particular piece of high ground was the four Tigers attached to 1st SS Recon Battalion. And the commander of this Tiger group was a young man by the name of Michael Wittmann. From ranges of a thousand meters right down to point blank range, the men of what would become the leaders of the 101st SS Heavy Tank Battalion and their four Tigers tore the Soviets apart. But the fighting was, without doubt, the most intense tank warfare in history. At one stage, Wittmann's gunner destroyed a T 34, setting it alight, only for it to keep driving at them, ramming into their Tiger. Luckily for Wittmann and his crew, their shot had slowed them down enough to prevent any critical damage. There was no actual figure of how many tanks they ended up destroying in this individual action, but what is for sure is that all four of the Tigers survived. The few T-34s that had made it past Wittmann's unit were destroyed by the 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment under the command of Joachim Piper, and the Soviet attack was eventually repulsed. By the end of the day, Wittmann and his men had held the line, with the wreckage of Soviet tanks stretching to the horizon. However, the finest example of the Tiger occurred earlier that week. Staff Sergeant Franz Staudeger, from the same unit as Wittpen, though in a different element, was advancing his Tiger I through a town after serious combat during the day. His tracks were shot to hell, and his running gear in disrepair. The recovery elements of his unit worked hard to get his tank back into fighting shape. When up ahead, the nearby Panzergrenadier unit holding the perimeter around the town, came under attack by the Soviet 10th Tank Corps. The Germans were in a tight situation. No armour was readily available to repel this attack, and the infantry were hard-pressed. 50 T-34s commenced an assault, quickly overrunning the perimeter and heading into the main defensive line. Staudegger's Tiger was finally repaired, at which point the mechanics switched to another Tiger too damaged to move. They fully expected Staff Sergeant Staudegger to withdraw and save his vehicle. Nope. Staudegger ordered his Tiger forward to the edge of the town to support the hard-pressed Panzer Grenadier unit. What ensued was one hell of a firefight. During the battle, his Tiger stood alone against the entire Soviet column. He had expended some ammunition in the fighting prior to this, but even so, he still had a considerable amount of armor piercing. This he kept sending down range, wiping out one T-34 after another. Until halfway through this firefight, his loaders screamed over the intercom, <laughs> around the incredible wall of noise, that they were down to high explosive. Staudegger's response to this was, fuck it, my 88 gun is big enough, and so he started sending the HE as well, which in turn wiped out several more Soviet tanks. 
After the battle ended, the Soviets withdrew, leaving 22 of their comrades' tanks behind, burning or wrecked in the field. What's insane is, Staudegger's kill tally is actually 24, because a couple nights before this he had walked up onto a group of T-34s, thinking in the dark that they were Panthers, only to realise they weren't. Once he noticed they were Soviets, he tossed grenades into the open hatches of two of the stationary tanks and fucking booked it back to his own tank, destroying both the T-34s in the process. Needless to say, this man received the Knight's Cross, which is significant as he was the first Tiger crewman to receive such an honour. Conspicuous individual heroism and valour on the field of battle, however inspiring or important, usually only wins small unit actions, it doesn't win wars. And in this case, that was true. By July 14th, the Germans had run out of steam. They were stuck. And the Soviets began to roll them back. What's worse is that the Allies landed in Sicily the same week, drawing off the possibility of any reserves being sent to assist them. But they were committed. They had to continue the push or at least coordinate a fighting retreat, but the emo authoritarian immediately ordered what reserves were present at Kursk to reinforce Italy, including a unit of Ferdinands. Ferdinands. The tank that combusts spontaneously going up a five degree incline. In Italy. One of the most mountainous countries in Europe. <sighs> Fuck me. Naturally, the commanders on the ground threw a collective fit, but again, De Führer is always right. Not that it actually matters. The Germans didn't stand a chance at this point anyway. As the Soviets attacked, the once proud Panzer divisions fell back, once again leaving their brand new weapon, the Panther, behind. Along with more examples of the German heavies. But most of all, they had left behind the initiative. They had turned over possession, and now the Soviets had the ball, and they were going to use it. With the Allies preparing for their major offensive to begin the long march to Berlin, everyone knew the war was lost. But given the circumstances, especially with the crimes of the Nazi regime currently underway, Germany had no alternative. They had one option. At this point, the career of our titular tank was essentially that of a fire engine. A heavily armed and armoured war criminal fire engine, but a fire engine nonetheless. As the Wehrmacht retreated on all fronts, the Tigers were constantly redeployed to different sectors, and due to the aforementioned logistical clusterfuck that is the Wehrmacht, and especially that of the Tiger, on many occasions the Tigers redeployed by road. Wear and tear on the vehicles was so extreme that the average nominal strength for a Tiger unit was often 50%, if not worse. The Battle of Kursk, a strategic level operation, was the only time the Tiger formations operated at full strength, and even then, only for a single day. Even so, this monster of a vehicle would have the last hurrah. Its replacement, the Tiger II, was now entering service, and as though their cries were carried on the wind, the lamentations of every mechanic in the Panzerwaffe could be heard. Their anguished cries only to be silenced by the endless grinding disintegration of gearboxes and transmissions. Their production run on the Tiger I was stopped to make way for this new behemoth. The last of these new Tigers were redeployed to the west. The war may be lost, but the Reich's last hurrah would be carried forward on their tracks. All they needed was their opponent to come and face them. But given the weather, there's no way they're going to be at it this month. Hey. Hey, you guys see something out there? They look like boats. A lot of boats. Holy shit. Primo Victoria. June? In Normandy? Jesus, that's brave. Yes, as you're all well aware, 
On June 6th, 1944, Team Freedom decided that it was finally time for their whirlwind European tour. After all, it was unfair that DJ Harris had gotten all the fun up to now. The Germans, meanwhile, were kind of dumbfounded. Rommel, who was now in charge of forces in France, was visiting his wife for her birthday when the Allies showed up. However, despite being commander of the forces in theatre, he was not in overall command. That belonged to Field Marshal Gerd von Lutstedt, and they didn't get along. Partly due to the class distinctions, as uh, von Rundstedt was from a noble Prussian officer tradition, while Rommel was a self-made man, and because Rommel was a hard-charging lead from the front, always on the offense kind of field commander, while Rundstedt was the calculating staff officer type. Given the situation in France, Rommel assessed, quite correctly in my mind and in the view of most historians, that the armour reserves for the beach defences should be kept as close to the landing beaches as possible, due to the fact that Allied air supremacy would prevent a significant redeployment of the panzers to the invasion area once it begins. As such, they would need to already be in place, ready to attack. Rundstedt, who thus far had only fought in the Blitz of 1940 or in the East, had not seen for himself the Allied air force's capabilities and favoured a more mobile reserve able to respond to any invasion area. The argument had been ongoing for months until the Bohemian Corporal had intervened. He split the Panzer divisions up into forward deployment and reserves and made it clear that the reserve Panzers would only be moved on his express authority. All this solution achieved was to split an already thinly spread force into an even more thinly spread force and render the reserve worthless and combat ineffective. And so, when the Allied invasion finally happened, the only Panzer Division available to Rommel was the 21st Panzer Division around Khan, and they had seized the initiative, driving a wedge straight between Juno and Sword Beach. In fact, they had almost succeeded in threatening the invasion in this sector, but without the backup of the other Panzer Divisions, the Allies repulsed this effort and retook the offensive, throwing them right back to Khan. Due to the failure of the Allies to get significant numbers of armour on the beach, had Rommel been given the reserves, it's possible that they could have thrown everyone back into the channel, or at least done far more damage than they actually did. The Allied bridgehead by now, however, was secure, and they began pushing out into the surrounding countryside. However, the Bocage country, full of hedgerows and small hamlets, was an absolute paradise for the defensive forces. Almost no progress was being made, as the German defenders of the 91st and 352nd Infantry Divisions worked together with their comrades in the 6th Falschermjäger Regiment to hold off the invaders in a constant series of ferocious small unit engagements. In the American sector, Carantan and its surrounding countryside was the scene of dramatic and desperate combat between airborne forces of both sides while Allied armoured formations were being savaged in deadly AT ambushes between the hedgerows. But it is in the British Eastern Sector where this battle was at its deadliest, as the British advance threatened Caen and the main roads into Eastern France, Paris, and ultimately Germany. Therefore, the German High Command perceived this as the biggest threat. The bulk of German reserves were shifted to face the British advance, moving under the cover of darkness to avoid the Allied air units, they crept into position. The British ran headlong into the reinforcements dug in around Khan and were promptly hurled back. On the left flank, Panzerlehr was rolling into position and attached to them was the 101st SS Heavy Tank Battalion with a full formation of Tigers. In fact, there were a considerable number of German heavies present in Normandy due to just how many SS Panzer divisions were there in France under refit. The first wave of heavy armoured support for the Germans arrived on the 12th of June. The delay had been due to the distance combined with the aforementioned nighttime only movements as Allied fighter bombers laid waste to any traffic on the roads during the day. Now they were in position and ready to get to work. That night, they set up camp in the town of villers Bocage. The Allied thrust was mainly towards Khan and St. Lo, so things should be quiet now. Finally. Not this time. It's time for payback. Prepare for! Prepare for! Get under! 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 Get under!
13th of June, the British 7th Armoured Division, known as the Desert Rats, advanced into the town. After encountering the German recon screen, they commenced an attack to the east, attempting to flank the main forces defending Khan to the north. As they proceeded along the main road, however, hell descended upon them. Having been alerted by said recon screen, Michael Wittmann had mounted his tiger and immediately charged forward to engage, ordering his other tanks to follow one table. Bursting out of a hedge to the rear of the British column in an ambush, Wittmann destroyed the Sherman Firefly to the rear of the formation, as well as a Cromwell. While his comrades eliminated the rest of the column, he then turned down the road and charged, sending HE and MG rounds into everything he saw, wiping out an entire convoy's worth of Bren carriers, trucks, and half-tracks. The British infantry were left powerless. Their six-pounder gun was ineffective as the behemoth was now running them down. They scattered in a panic as Wittmann rolled past. He then came across the 4th Armoured Recon Company, comprised of four Stuarts. Women engaged, knocking out three of the Stuarts. He then engaged two Cromwells, who had been moving to assist, destroying one while the other ran for cover, but he wasn't done. Oh no. It was then he came across the headquarters section and their command tanks. Immediately traversing his gun to face the new threat, both command vehicles were immediately immolated at very close range before wiping out the headquarters scout car and the units met at half-track. At this point, another Firefly engaged. Realising he had pushed his luck far enough, Wittmann began to withdraw, traversing his gun rearward to clear his escape route. As he did so, the Cromwell that had earlier ran came into view, hoping to shoot his tiger's rear. Wittmann's gunner didn't even need the order. That Cromwell, too, was obliterated at close range. After the carnage was complete, he retreated out of town where the six pounder AT gun crew had gotten their shit together and finally disabled the monster that had just routed their entire force. Wittmann and his crew abandoned their tiger, escaping on foot to their comrades now rolling down the street. By the end of the action, his tally stood at 11 tanks, two anti tank guns, and 13 transport vehicles for the loss of one tiger. The Panzer Lair and the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Regiment continued to attack after Wittmann's daring charge, but the British had reorganised by that stage. Fighting was rather intense as the Tigers split up independently to flank and engage. The Panzer Grenadiers, meanwhile, assaulted the town itself, fighting house to house. The British, realising they were outmatched, began to conduct a fighting retreat. The Germans followed close, keeping up the pressure. However, upon forcing the British out of town, they ran into their prepared positions and reinforcing elements, and then the Germans were forced back. And so, after this ferocious battle, it remained status quo ante. The British lost 27 tanks and a large convoy worth of vehicles. The Germans had lost 15 tanks, six of them Tigers. However, as the Germans retained the field, they could recover the ones they had just lost due to tracking or engine damage. But in keeping with the theme, this action was more noticeable precisely because of its rarity. Later, during the fighting around Khan, Michael Wittmann was killed. And once the British finally broke through, the backs of the Panzer formations were broken. Combine that with Omar Bradley kicking in the door and launching Operation Cobra, paving the way for Patton's legendary drive at the head of Third Army, the Germans were thrown out of France, finally being trapped and almost completely destroyed in the Falaise pocket. But even after all this, they still had some fight left. The Allies soon reached the edge of their supply lines and came to a halt. Given this reprieve, the Germans reorganised and formed ranks. They were going to make the Allies pay for every inch, which was just as well, because at that precise moment on the Eastern Front, things went to shit. In the greatest bait-and-switch in military history, in my opinion anyway, the Soviets had convinced the Axis of mild disappointment, Romania, Hungary and Germany, that they were actually going for the Ukraine during their summer offensive, and thus drew all of the Eastern Front's reserves to the south. When this happened, the Soviets then launched a surprise offensive out of the Kursk salient at the Northern Front, encircling and destroying the entirety of Army Group Center, while cutting off half of Army Group North, lifting the Siege of Leningrad. 
Seeing the Soviets literally charging towards Central Europe, the Western Allies needed a plan to invade Germany, and they needed it quickly. What they came up with was... enthusiastically ambitious. It's raining men! Hallelujah! It's raining men! The Tiger played a crucial role in Operation Market Garden as we know. The operation itself puts the plans of the Japanese Navy to shame in terms of complexity. A huge airborne deployment across most of Holland, followed by a single axis of advance down one road, and every moving part has to succeed in sequence. The British first airborne landed on what remained of the SS Panzer units that had fought in France, while the other airborne units had encountered German reserve units far in excess of what was expected. In what would be the final German victory of the war, the Battle of Arnhem was one of heroic resistance by British and Polish paratroopers. Resistance which, due to poor planning, rushed logistics and the sheer arrogance of its chief architect, and at the front of the advance to crush their final stand around the town of Osterbeek were the Tigers of 2nd SS Panzer Corps. Although it was not easy for them, as demonstrated by the actions of Victoria Cross winner Robert Kane, who disabled several Tigers himself with a piat and some cheerful British optimism, combined with seething combat-induced rage, but without 30 Corps armour to reinforce them, the paratroopers were doomed to their fate. Operation Market Garden failed, and the surviving Allied units retreated to rest up for the winter. Next year was going to be tough, but at least they'll have Christmas off. Right? Then it came. The final cut. The closing act, which yet again created another bulge. Ooh, ooh. <sighs> you would think that, considering it's exactly what they did last time, the Allies would have put some extra guards or some reserves in the Ardennes, you know? Just in case. But they, again, thought that no one was going to try something that stupid let alone for the second time, and especially without control of the air. However, they forgot to consider that if it's snowing and planes can't fly, the enemy only has to control the ground. Which, uh, with the new heavy weapons, they very well could. Once more, the Tiger would see battle, but this time it was its successor, the Tiger II, which stole the limelight. Nevertheless, throughout the Battle of the Bulge, the Tiger I did its duty. However, by now the Allies had fielded large number of upgunned vehicles, such as the Sherman Firefly, the M18 Hellcat, the M36 Jackson, the Comet, and the Pershing. And when General Patton's Third Army counterattacked, it spelled the final doom of the SS Second Panzer Corps. The German offensive to take Antwerp and split the Allies failed. The 101st Airborne Division held their ground on the main supply route at Bastogne impairing the resupply and reinforcement of the German advance. Their plan, as well as their request for surrender, was eloquently and appropriately defined by the men of the 101st, and it was done with a single word. Nuts. Meanwhile, on the Ost front, the Soviets had upgraded their T-34s with 85mm guns, as the IS-2s and ISU-152s began making their presences felt. In fact, they had been known as beast killers because of their ability to destroy German heavy tanks. The retreat into Poland and East Prussia was defined by the burning tanks and ruined buildings as the Soviets had to pay for every inch of ground against a determined and by this stage desperate defence. At the Battle of the Hochwald Gap in the west, the Canadians were mauled by tigers dug in on the high ground, while the Americans struggled in clearing the Hurtgen Forest. World War II in Europe was coming to a close, and yet the tiger fought on and on and on. On April 11th, 1945, a tiger ambushed a column of Shermans, destroying three tanks along with an M8 scout car. 
While up north in the British sector the very next day, another Tiger destroyed a pair of Comet tanks, a scout car and a half-track, before being destroyed by a third Comet. But the last action of the Tiger, the very last action, came in the burning embers of Berlin. During the Soviet advance towards the Reichstag and the Brandenburg Gate, they had to cross the famous Berlin Tiergarten, now reduced to barren trees and churned earth. And standing in their way was the last tiger of Panzerabteilung Muncheberg. After fighting ferociously with the oncoming attackers over the past week since the Battle of the Salo Heights, the crew expended the last of their munitions. Being out of fuel and out of ammo, they were forced to abandon the tank, fighting on foot in the defense of the Reichstag, leaving their vehicle to the Soviets while they made their desperate last stand. The date was April 30th, 1945. That night, Soviet troops raised their flag over Berlin and its most famous building. And it's this day, our story ends. Because as the last tiger stood in the shadow of Berlin's greatest landmarks, the man ultimately responsible for its creation, finally accomplished what assassins and air raids had failed to do in 15 years. And despite the evil regime the tiger served, its contributions to the history of armoured warfare cannot be understated. And like her monstrous master, it cannot be denied that she went down swinging. We're going down, down in an earlier round. The sugar, we're going down swinging. I'm being